How's it going, guys? Uh, my name is John Merriman, for those of you that don't know me. Uh, and I will be covering with you uh, some basics of the R programming language. Then Alex will be doing a quick demo of gradient descent after. So jumping right in, what is R? Uh, R is a language and environment used mostly for statistical computation and graphics. Uh, so it's often referred to as the statistician's tool of choice. And as uh, Brian had mentioned earlier, it is fit to use. It's meant for data science. Uh, R includes a large array of data manipulation and data analysis functions, uh, which I'll go over some of those here shortly. Uh, R is open source, uh, similar to Python, in that it uses, uh, many users can write their own packages. Uh, and you also have R and R Studio. So R is your programming language, and R Studio is your integrated development environment. So to the right, you can see this whole graphic is R Studio. In the bottom left corner is uh, the console, which is basically your R programming. Uh, so you have to the right of that, uh, you can see your plots. If you have multiple plots, you can click your arrow. Uh, the help function is very useful if you're using a package that you've never used before. It can kind of get you on the right track. Above that, you also have um, your workspace. Uh, within your workspace, you have your calculated values, your objects, and your functions. So we'll go into some useful packages. Uh, so basically, anytime you're using R, the process will be along the lines of the order in which I go through these. So first of all, you want to load your data. Uh, the first two packages uh, use SQL. Uh, you can bring in SQL database, and you can start to query within R. Uh, the next package, uh, XLSX, is for Excel spreadsheets. Uh, once you've loaded in your data, you want to manipulate your data. Uh, so that you can start to really only focus on the areas in which you're interested in for building your model. Uh, so that first package, DPLYR, it's uh, actually the most package used, uh, the most popular package within R. Uh, it's very useful for filtering your data and uh, kind of selecting only what you what it is that you need. Uh, TidyR is a very good uh, package for cleansing your data. You can get rid of your null values and your blank spaces. Uh, once you've done that, you want to visualize your data to make sure that your man manipulations have worked. Uh, I would suggest, honestly, kind of doing those last two steps iteratively between manipulating and visualizing. Go back and forth until you feel really comfortable with what you have before you start to model. Uh, so for modeling data, there are plenty of uh, packages that you could use. Um, it really just depends on the case and what you're trying to solve. Um, so the stats package is actually a built-in uh, package within R, uh, and there's tons of statistical functions within that. Uh, forecast is for forecasting data over a time series. Random Forest is a crowd favorite. It's one of my favorites just because in school they really like to focus on that one. Uh, from there, uh, once we feel good about the results that we have, we're ready to get it in front of somebody. We don't want to just send them our R code. We want to put it into a nice report. Uh, at the very beginning of our presentation, R, uh, Brian actually used R Markdown to put together that report. Okay, let's go into some pros and cons. Uh, first and foremost, R is free and it's open source, similar to uh, Python. So the fact that it's free actually lends itself really well to a lot of these pros. Uh, so R is also highly customizable uh, with models and graphics. Uh, one of the packages that I didn't really speak to very much was uh, ggplot2. That is the most popular package for visualizations within R. The reason why is you can get very, very particular with what you want to see in your graphic. It's not like an Excel where you go to suggested graphics and you're like, well, that's not really what I was looking for. Um, another big pro is that you can use R within Azure LML. Uh, the reason why this is very uh, useful is because you can use the, you can leverage the pro of Azure ML's deployability uh, and you can deploy an existing R code in Azure. Uh, R has a very vast online community, uh, which is very nice because a lot of the things that you do in R uh, may be the first time you ever do it. So for gradient descent, for example, I had never done that in R. I didn't just know how to do it. I had to reach out to the online community through a Stack Overflow and R pubs and such. Uh, R is gaining a lot of traction, uh, especially within education. So the popularity in education is lending itself very well to the adoption of R. Uh, me personally, I took two semesters of our programming. The first one just basically focused on fundamentals. Then the next one actually got to do a, a project in which I built a lot of predictive models for a data set. Uh, so moving on to cons, uh, R is heavy code oriented. And this is really just speaking towards uh, Azure ML. Uh, Azure ML is more of a click and drag. 
uh, very easy to use, uh, whereas R, you need to have some programming knowledge. Uh, R has a steep learning curve at first, uh, meaning basically once you get used to the syntax and the way that R works, uh, and you really start to build a statistical mindset, you're going to become very dangerous, and you can really just start to do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, R has uh, fairly poor memory management because usually you would run it off your local server, but uh, there is a solution. You can actually use a R service through, actually no, that's not the solution. Uh, the solution is that you uh, can spin up a VM in the cloud. Uh, the next solution, single threaded, uh, is a big con. Uh, basically this is saying you can only uh, perform one action at a time in R, so the solution to that is to run uh, your code in SQL using R services. Since uh, SQL is a multi-instance program, you can then start to do some parallel processing. Uh, the next con is that R uses a one-based numbering system. Uh, I was kind of on the fence about whether I want to put this in the pros and cons. Uh, the reason why I see it as a pro is because it is a statistician's tool. Uh, one-based numbering makes a lot of sense in, st uh, in statistics. Uh, but the reason why it's in the con list is because a lot of programs, if you're used to or if you've ever worked with C Sharp or a Java, they used a zero-based numbering system. So some of the things would be a little bit different there. Okay, so when do we use R? Uh, Chris Pratt does not know, and he is afraid to ask. So I will tell you. Um, so uh, the name of the game is statistical computation. Uh, R is basically where statistics meets computer science. Uh, we can build a data profile within R, which is really nice if you're really trying to you're seeing data for the first time, if it's a large data set, you don't want to just start scrolling through the rows. You want to build something that where you can really visualize the data uh, easily. Uh, you can wrangle and manipulate your data, as I had mentioned before. Um, once you have everything that you are trying to model, you can start to perform some descriptive analytics and uh, basically getting an idea of what the historical data is telling you. From there, once you have that, you can start to split your data into training and testing, as Brian had mentioned and uh, you can start to build some pretty cool predictive models. So I'll pass it over to Alex to do our demo. I want to start by just going over what it's like to work in our studio before we get to the gradient descent. Um, so as, as John pointed out, here's the console down here. So if you're running just base R without our studio, you would just see this console here. You could type directly into it, do three plus two and see what that answer is. Um, and then you have your environment over here, which if you assign variables, functions, you're going to see them over here. And then help and plots, you'll see down here, just like John said. So you know, R, R's good. You can do simple math, like we have this one. Oh, my solution's not here. I'm going to have to do control enter. Um, so there we see, just get the answer printed out to the console. And another way to do that is to just assign the values themselves. So we'll say x is three times five plus two, and then now you could do x to the power of four from that, and we'll get the same answer. One assigning variables, one just directly printing it. Um, so to create vectors in R, it uses this C and then parentheses. You can make vectors with dates, numbers, text. I'm just going to do it with the numbers here. So then we have this vector one four nine. You add two to it, it's going to add two to each number in that vector. And if we assign a new vector of also three numbers and you add those together, it's going to add individually each value, which is useful when working with columns in your data frame, knowing how that works. Um, so to create a matrix, it's kind of the same idea. Um, so I'm going to make two matrices here and print them out. And now if you wanted to bind matrices or data frames together, you can use the C bind and it will combine them based off their columns. So you have new columns or you can do R bind it will get new rows. So now getting to more specific what we're going to do, R can read in our data. So we set the working directory and then read in the data set that we've all gotten sick of at this point. Read, so read that in and you can view a summary of it. We can see min, max, quartiles, median, mean. Now if you want to reference a specific column in R, we use that dollar sign. So say we put MPG dollar sign, now it's going to come up with my columns from that data set, it's going to help you out there. And RStudio, another reason RStudio is useful, you can see you can see reference functions you've made, functions that are installed in R, and so we'll pull in, there's that column, you can make a simple plot using a plot function, so oh, it's already there, and you can zoom in here, so we see plot weight versus 
MPG. If I want to make this nice and pretty, I'm going to use that ggplot package, but that would take too long. So I'm going to define a new column here. So I just set a new name, we called it new with the dollar sign. I'm going to initialize it to be zero. And I'm going to say here, if you wanted to define what this column is going to be, so we put in this brackets here. So this column, MPG new, where the year is greater than or equal to 80, assign a value of one to that column. And now with that, I can subset the data. So we're going to say subset here, subset this, where that new value is one, but I just want to see the name and the MPG of those. So you run that, and then you see it popped up over here in the environment, you double click on it, it'll come up here. So you got the names of all the cars that were after the year 80 and their MPGs. Uh, if you wanted to reference a specific column, then you put the comma first, specific row, specific point. Um, if you wanted to change the names of the columns, you just have to use this call names function. Notice I'm only putting in three here. Um, but if we look at it, so you'll see I got the column names here, but I just put NA for the other one. So I'd have to go back and put more names for those. Uh, to install packages, so I'm going to install this PLYR package, install package. You just have to do the install package the first time. See, I'm getting an error because it's already been installed. After that, you just have to load it. And if you want to look and see what this package can do, you can do the question mark. It comes up in this health help menu down here. You can see what this package does, functions in this package, click on them. And this is where you always go because it's useful. It tells you exactly what it expects as its inputs and what it's going to output when you do it. So I'm going to use this function from that package called ddplyr, which applies one function to every column here. So I'm going to summarize my data set by year and look at the mean of all the other columns by year. We can view that here. You see I have one row for each year and then we got the mean of all the columns using that function from the package. <laughs> and we can write this out if we wanted to save it for future use. I'm not going to write it onto Brian's machine, but if I run that, it would he would find it later. Uh, okay, so let's go to the uh, gradient descent. So they've already we've already talked a lot about gradient descent, so I'm going to breeze through some of the technical parts of it and just stick to how it is in R. So let me clear what we've done so far. So we're going to set our working directory, read in our data, view the data. And now we can see here in the data, we're trying to predict the MPG based off these columns. Name isn't going to be very useful because all these have different names for the most part. Um, origin is a categorical variable, which means so it has this it has values of 1, 2, or 3 but there's no really numerical meaning behind that. And so the way we get around that when doing regression is creating a dummy variable. We have one column for each of those. So yes or no if origin's one, yes or no if it's two, yes or no if it's three. Um, and also one thing we noticed when we were going through this data set, it, which is an important thing to look out for, there's some NA values in horsepower. So we're gonna have to address that also before we do the model. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take out that name thing because I don't care about it. Um, and then we're going to set these new three columns for origin one, origin two, and origin three. And we're going to use what we learned in that last one, which is, so if origin is one, then I'm going to assign the value of one for that first column. If it's two, I'm going to assign the value of one for the second column. And then I don't need that origin column anymore. i got three new ones. You see we got three columns now, one for each of the origins. It's going to be one if it was one in this column, one if it was two. Right, now I want to replace those NA values. So the way we are going to do it, there's lots of different ways you can do it. It kind of depends on the situation. In this case, I'm going to replace it with the median. So we calculate the median of horsepower. We'll see it over here. Oh, and I also was calculating the median. That's what this means. I'm ignoring those NA values when calculating the median. And I'm going to assign every value that is NA here. I'm going to assign them that median value. Now we're going to normalize it. Brian already explained the benefits of normalizing, so I made this function to normalize. And now I need to apply that normalizing to every column except for MPG, because I don't want to predict a normalized MPG. I just want MPG. Um, all right, now i got to split the test and training set to solve for overfitting. So set seed, so we can make it reproducible. Now I'm going to split it. I decided to do 75% for the training, 25% for the test. Again kind of depends on the situation, how you're going to do it. More data and training is best, but if we can survive without it, then we will. Uh, so train test, 
Now I'm going to create that gradient descent function. It's really long. And again, Brian already explained it, so now it's really short. Okay, now I'm going to set my parameters here. So what, what we have here at this 0.05, I have as the learning rate, this is the convergence threshold. So if the mean square error between our iterations is less than that, then stop, we're good enough. And max iterations, if you still haven't converged by this point, probably not going to, so give up. Um, now I'm going to run this, and we're going to print out the mean square error on the console so we can see as it converges to that point. Oh, so I'm doing mean square error. I think Brian and Henry both did mean absolute error. Again, depends on your preference. Oh, hold on. Didn't run that yet. All right, so it just takes a few seconds. There, now we converge. So you can see all these errors are printing out. We're looking for when they stopped increasing by less than this value. And so we're good. So now I printed out, I got all my coefficients. I wrote, put them in a nice little data frame for us. Um, and now I'm going to use these coefficients to make my prediction. And that's the wrong one. Bear with me. All right, okay, sorry. Here's my prediction. And we can look at my predictions here. So the first column here is the actual value, and the second is the prediction. You can see some of these, we are pretty close. Like this one's very close. Some of them off by a few, but pretty good. Um, and then we can, we're can we going to check my R squared to see how much of the variation my model describes. So what we get here is 80%, so about 80% of the variance in the, mod, in the data we've described with this model which is pretty good, not great, but good. Now, to check for overfitting, we need to make predictions off the training data set and make sure this isn't significantly larger, which is what we do here, and the R squared for that is about 82%, so a little bit bigger, but we did not overfit, which is good. Now, uh, here's the one line for Brian. He wants to do it in one line. Yeah. We could just make a linear model. We want to predict MPG. I want to use all these columns from my data, and it's just as easy as that. And we give you a summary of that, and we can see my coefficients that it came out with, and, that, and we can see p-value. So it looks like parameters that are very powerful to this model are weight, which makes sense, uh, displacement, origin 1 or origin 2. Good thing I split those up. And yeah, that's it.